morning. Good morning, good morning. We have come to worship this morning. Our God is faithful. Our God is good. Amen. He is worthy of the highest praise this morning. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for a new day to be in your house. Lord, we come to honor you. We come to worship the name of Jesus this morning. God, I pray that you would cleanse our hearts and our minds right now, God. Just wash us this morning, oh God. We pray that as we come into your presence, you would change us. You would refresh us, oh God. That we would be filled once again with your spirit, oh God. We pray that the name of Jesus would be glorified in this place, oh God. Would you have your way in our midst? In Jesus' name, amen.
Can we just take a few moments just focusing on Jesus? Come on, just worship Him. Reach out to Him. Praise and exalt His name. Hallelujah. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we focus on you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. these moments in time that we're not just standing alone, we're standing together as a body of believers in God. He inhabits the praises of his people. But you know what? I was thinking of the whole concept of faith and, you know, sometimes I'm sure we're all facing something that just seems overwhelming. It just seems impossible. And it's like, you know, we just get defeated and discouraged. But we have to be reminded that every story in the Bible that we rejoice in or that we take comfort in at times have been people who have faced overwhelming circumstances and when they had to believe it was it was the hardest thing to do but against all hope the Bible says Abraham believed and you know there was a time and when the people of God were trying to rebuild the temple and trying to move forward spiritually that it was just one obstacle and one discouragement and one challenge after another and then the word of the Lord came uh, to the prophet in Zechariah 4 and it says, what are you, who are you O mountain? Who are you? Who do you think you are? But before Zerubbabel you become a plane. And it won't be by might, it won't be by power, but it'll be by God's spirit. And this morning every mountain you and I face it just screams at us, give up. It just screams at us, quit. It just screams at us, there's no hope. But the word of the Lord is, who are you O mountain? Before 
Zerubbabel, it should become a plague. And this morning, we need to just exercise our faith one last time, one more time, one more time this morning and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. The Lord would say to us, all things are possible for those that believe. Come on, let's believe God one more time, one more time in this situation, one more moment, we express our faith. And we're going to sing, God, turn it around. And we're going to just declare it. We're just going to prophesy, God, you're going to turn it around. God, you're going to do it, God. God, I'm not going to lack in faith. I'm not going to give up, God. If Abraham can wait years, I can wait years. Come on, we're going to believe God this morning. I want you to move out of your seat. I want you to sing it. I want you to prophesy it. I want you to declare it this morning. I want you to believe it today. Come on, we're people of faith. It might look impossible, but our God is a God of the impossible. Come on, one more time. Believe God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on.
turn our praise into prayer right now and just, just bring to the Lord the needs that are represented in your individual lives, our church, our community, our nation. Can we just take a few moments to just have a mini prayer meeting, lifting up our voice all over this place. Come on, would you begin to pray right now? Those things you're believing God to turn around, it could be something in your family, it could be the, the condition of our, our culture, our nation, all the things that we're facing. Come on, now's the time. This is a, a, a prime moment, a prime opportunity to call on God. God and rejoice with you. Praise the Lord, saints. Yeah. Um, I've been battling um, thyroid cancer for the last eight months. Um, I had my first surgery in September. And I had lymph nodes that were not going down, and doctors assumed they were a lymphoma. Um, well, we waited a couple of months to see if any of the lymph nodes went down, but unfortunately, I had to do a biopsy. The biopsy came back. Uh, unconclusive. I just had surgery two weeks ago to remove the rest of the lymph nodes, and it came back that it doesn't have lymphoma. That I don't have that in my body, and I can pray that God did not allow this disease to touch me. They were talking about chemo and, and radiation, and, but I'm here in the name of Jesus. I'm not believing. I pray that I thank the church for continuing to pray for me and my family. I thank all the people that was in my life that believe in God. God is a real God and He heals. Believing in Him. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give the Lord praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Can we just 
sing one more song this morning. And I'm going to have you stand again. And one of the songs is your great name. And I want us just to, just to worship and honor him for what he's done. I believe all of us have testimonies. That's a dramatic testimony of a healing. But every single one of us have a testimony of what God has done. And can we just give God glory this morning? And, and, and you know what? I believe it's so critical that we are grateful. Would you stand together with me one more time, lifting up our voice, and turn to the person next to you and say, there's no reason for you to be quiet this morning. No, tell them like you really need it. Amen. There's no reason. There's no reason for us to be quiet this morning. Amen. Amen. You might be discouraged. You might be going through something and it clouds the whole horizon, but, but don't forget. Don't forget what the Lord has done. The Bible says, forget not all his benefits. Come on, we, we forget. We forget sometimes. And, and right now, if, as the people of God, you individually, God's looking at your heart. This isn't for the person next to you. This isn't for someone else. You're not trying to impress me or anybody. This is you and God. And you're just saying, your name is great. I worship you. I put aside my attitude. I put aside my bitterness. I put aside my unforgiveness. I put aside what I'm going through today, God. I'm not going to let the devil mute me. I'm not going to let the devil cancel me. I'm going to praise. I'm going to declare your great name. Can we do that for the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ? Lost our saints, find their way at the sound of your great name. All who live feel no shame at the sound of your
We pray now right now, Father, that your name would be lifted high. It would be lifted high in our city, in our nation, and around the world. Father, we pray that the lost would find you again, God. The lost in families, we pray, God, that the redeeming love of Jesus would find it in the hearts of those who are lost, those who are confused, those who have been hurt, that the broken would be restored, oh God. Even in our church, in this room right now, those watching on the live stream, Holy Spirit, that you would just move. Comfort those who need comfort in God. Comfort those who are mourning God. Those who are experiencing loss. We thank you for your spirit this morning, your presence. Continue the restorative work that you're doing in and through us this morning, oh God. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, before you're seated, take just a minute and welcome a few people that are sitting around you. Morning, Victory family. Morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Maxwell, what's up, man? How you doing, my friend? Good to see you. It's so awesome to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Yeah. You just feel his presence. Yeah. Well, we want to just take a few moments and uh, just give a couple of announcements just to remind you of what's happening. If you could, again, just continue sharing our live stream. We say it every Sunday, but we want to remind you, you never know who's going to get connected with what's going on in the life of the church. That helps us out, helps our social media out. So go right ahead and hit that. If you're watching on our live stream, you can simply share it just by tapping it right now. We want to remind you, Wednesday nights, we have something for the entire family. We have life groups for the adults. Are you guys enjoying Revelation? What chapter are you guys in right now? Chapter 6. Awesome. Moving right along. Getting into the good stuff, huh? So we want to encourage parents to come out for that. If you have kids or teens, we have youth. We have a great time with our youth in the cafe. We also have children's ministry and nursery. We also want to remind you, um, if you did you get a, a pamphlet when you came in today? If you didn't, you can get one on your way out. What we are going to be doing is joining. If you could put that slide up, Paul. Just We're going to be praying for America. And so, how many of you know that it's important to be praying right now? More now than ever before for our nation. So much is happening, and so starting June 5th to July 4th, we as a church are going to be praying every day. And uh, we as a staff are going to be putting things on our social media and having prayer focuses for each one of those days. And so we want to encourage you to join with us. Those uh, sheets that you got will have uh, just a full spread of exactly what we're going to be praying for each day. So take it, bring it home with you, take it to work with you, and just be praying with us. And we're going to believe at the end of these 30 days that God's going to do something. He's already doing something, but we just want to continue praying and pressing in. Amen? We also want to remind you of our Edify Singles Ministry. They have a couple events coming up. So June 11th, the Sweet and Sour Treats game. I want to go to that. I'm married, so I can't. My wife said, no, I can't go to that. But if you are single and you love games and snacks, that's a great opportunity for you to come out and connect. And then there is another event in September September 10th. And the reason why we're promoting it now, it's, it's actually a Rail Explorer Lantern ride, and they sell out so fast. So money is due like within the next few weeks. If you need more information, you can see Jessica or Elsa, or you can go into our church app, and we have all the information for all of these events. And if you have not yet downloaded our free church app, these are the things that you can do on it. You can give, but you can also go to the sign-ups and stay updated with what's happening in the life of the church. Amen? Amen. 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 We also want to welcome our first-time guests. If this is your first time here, could you just give us a little wave? And can we give a nice, loud welcome to Victory Church? Welcome, guys. Welcome. And those watching on our live stream, we welcome you. If you wouldn't mind helping us just by filling out one of our connection cards, they're right in the seat pocket in front of you. Whether you're just passing through or you're looking for a church to get connected with, we want to pray with you, answer any questions that you may have about the church, and connect you with people. Amen? We've had a great, just past couple of weeks, people are filling these out. We're calling and praying and just hearing awesome testimonies of what God is doing. Amen? Well... Before we go into our offering, how many of you know what we are uh, celebrating or remembering this weekend? We 
have Memorial Day, which is on Monday. And so we want to take just a few moments to honor. So in the, United, the United States has fought 12 major wars and numerous smaller skirmishes in its history. Memorial Day is how we honor the soldiers, sailors, airmen, airwomen, and Marines who did not return home. The holiday dates back to the months immediately following the Civil War, when a few towns and cities began honoring their dead. In 1868, General John A. Logan, at the time the head of an organization for Union veterans, later a U.S. Senator from Illinois, and the man for whom Logan Circle in Washington, D.C. is named, called for May 30th to be designated Decoration Day. He said the purpose would be for strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion. The holiday was renamed Memorial Day after World War I, and its purpose became to honor all Americans who have died fighting the nation's wars. Since 1971, Memorial Day has been celebrated on the last Monday in May. And so we wanted to show you a quick video clip to just honor what we're celebrating. I think it's important to remember that it's not just a day off so we don't have to go to work. There's a reason why our nation is called for it to be a day off. So we can take time throughout the day to remember why we have it off for those who sacrificed and gave their lives. So we're going to show you this clip and then pastor's going to come up and uh, we're going to pray. Amen. Sometime back, I received in the name of our country the bodies of four Marines who had died while on active duty. I said then that there is a special sadness that accompanies the death of a servicemen, but we're never quite good enough to them. Not really, we can't be, because what they gave us is beyond our powers to repay. And so when a serviceman dies, it's a tear in the fabric, a break in the hole, but all we can do is remember. It is, in a way, an odd thing to honor those who died in defense of our country, in defense of us, in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, gray and gray hair. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do to remember them and what they did and why they had to be brave for us. serving and what we're going to do is we're going to have them stand so if you are currently serving in any branch of the military or have served um, could you just stand and Memorial Day is a day to honor those who have passed and so what we're going to do is those who are standing and those who have served we want them to stand in the gap for those families who have lost loved ones and still suffer that loss to this day the pastor's going to come and pray and but can we just take one moment of silence, just 20 seconds of just silence, just to honor those who have lost their lives? Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's join in prayer together. Father, we... We do remember those who have paid the ultimate price so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we do in this country. And Father God, we, we also pray and ask a blessing over those that are presently serving and those that have served God. Many times they're, um, they're not thanked 
and not acknowledged, but we want to take a moment in your presence to acknowledge them and to pray for them, God. Pray a blessing over those that are serving, those that have been deployed. God, we ask that you keep your hand upon them. We ask that you protect them. Let your presence go with them. Let your presence be with them in a powerful way, God. Keep them through every challenge, through every battle, through every struggle. God, we pray a blessing over the families, over each and every one today that's standing. God, bring encouragement to them. Bring uh, a blessing to them, we pray today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Let's just give a hand for those who are standing up and thank you for so with and for you and your families. At this time, we are going to shift to give our offerings, our tithes, and our offerings. And just want to share a little story before I read a scripture. So I was away this past this weekend, um, officiating a wedding of an old youth of ours. And so I was away for a couple days. And so my daughter, Madeline, um, it's funny how kids miss you. You can only be gone a day and a half. It's like you've been gone months. So I got home and um, couldn't see it. I got home late last night, so I couldn't see them until this morning. But she came in and was so excited, she made me a card. And so she brought the card in, and um, she had a little picture of me in there. It looks a little bit like me, a little work. But she had two rocks in there, and uh, we like throwing rocks at Cold State Park. So she had found two rocks, and she had two candy bars. So she knows, she knows me. Um, and she also handed me a $20 bill. And I'm saying to Tara, she had told me ahead of time that she wanted to give it to me, and she had tried to convince her that she didn't need to do that, and she busted out crying, and she got very upset. She wanted to do it. And so in my head, I'm like, I can't think $20 for my daughter. And so I'm like trying to think, how can I like give this back without, so she gives it to me. And I just said, you know, this is, this is a gift that someone gave you. I said, if you don't need it, she's like, that's okay, Daddy. I have I have two other ones. And I'm like, two other them? Well, go get them. Gas price, right? Gas. But no, I told her this is the importance of, of what we wanted her to have it for, to get her something nice. And so we did the exchange and, and everything was fine. But, you know, as I was as we were praying in the cafe, the Lord, I was just thinking about that. And the Lord, I was just talking to the Lord. And he just began sharing his heart with me. It's him as our Heavenly Father. And giving is something that is, that sometimes we church people can be reluctant to do. It's the giving part of the sanctuary, people tense up and, but the Lord was reminding me of that encounter and in such a small level, that's the heart of our Father. And if we can have that heart that, that my daughter has in our giving, it's, it's what God can do in that. Because it's really not about the finances, it's about the heart. And people will argue and say, well, Giving was the law back then, and, it's the, and Jesus got rid of the law. No, it's not really about that, because you know what? If I rely on my own heart, the Word of God says that my heart is desperately sick, and that is evil. And so what giving does is it breaks that hold of greed. And when we can learn to do that and adopt that into our lives on a weekly basis, what God can do that and something to do with that. And some of you are struggling right now. And the Lord just reminded me of that scripture where Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, or which one of you, if his sons ask him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? And so I'm going to invite you to stand with me this morning as we pray over this offering. We have the ways to give behind me. But please, let this be a time where it's a reflection of who he is. I want to have that heart where I run to my father with my tithes and my offerings so freely to give because I can tell you, I honestly, genuinely did not want that. And God is not sitting up in heaven wanting what we give him, but he wants to see the heart behind him. That's what he desires to see, and that's what he works with. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this offering that's going to come in today. We praise you for each and every family that's here, those who are at home on live stream, those who will watch this at another time and, and be a part of the giving. We pray for an increase in their finances. We pray for a revelation of, of what I experienced this morning, of the heart of a father. Lord, you don't desire the, the monetary stuff. You desire the heart. And I pray that as we give this morning, 
something would be released in it, oh God. And we just pray that you are a heavenly father who desires to give good gifts to your children. And we are your children, God. And I just pray anyone in here who is in need, that they would ask their heavenly father. And Lord, they would see a return. They would see you meet each and every need with detail, oh God. And we pray for an increase with these finances. We pray for our youth expansion. We pray for our outreaches in the city. We pray, God, for our missionaries who are overseas and even here in our nation, serving and giving their lives to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you for all that we've been able to do. The Women of Judah Conference, God, the offerings that came in. Lord, that's going to bless the church in Liberia. Lord, this is your church giving. This is your church waving that money, just like my daughter, saying we want to give to this, oh God. And I pray that they would know that their Heavenly Father sees their heart. And God, that you're going to meet needs this morning. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You're at liberty to come forward to give this morning. Thank you for your giving. God bless you. I sing praises to your name. slide up, please uh, pray for America. This brochure, this pamphlet that you receive is something that the Assemblies of God as a, a movement across the nation, over 20,000 churches um, have just called for us to pray for America for 30 days. Now this is not something just one church, but this is literally thousands of churches. And I believe that focused prayer is powerful. So um, I'm just wanna, I want to just take a few moments to challenge you uh, to really pray, to uh, repost, to share what we put on Facebook, to encourage other people to pray. I believe that the day and age we're living in, we need to do more, not less, for the Lord's work. We need to pray more, not less. Amen? And this is a challenge because I believe our country is in desperate need of God. There has been a moral decline in our nation that is so obvious you do not have to be a Bible student, a Bible scholar. You don't even have to believe in the Bible uh, to, to identify the rapid decline of our culture. You might have heard this before, but um, in the 50s, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, in, in our schools, the major discipline problems in our public schools were cigarette smoking, 
skipping class, running in the halls, spitballs, <laughs> chewing gum, and whispering in class. Those were the major disciplinary problems that our teachers, our administrators, and our faculty had to deal with in our schools. Today, the major problems, so sad to say, so heartbreaking, kids carrying guns, knives, and assault weapons. The major problems in our school, followed by arson, drugs, Teenage pregnancy, vandalism, and drunkenness. Recently, in a Florida high school, a teacher observed a number of boys in the corner of the gymnasium on their hands and knees. And this teacher rushed up and demanded, what are you doing? One of the boys looked up and said, we're shooting dice, we're gambling. The teacher responded, oh, thank goodness, I thought you were praying. In 1962, prayer was removed from our schools. A couple decades later, in the 80s, the display of the Ten Commandments was also removed in our schools. We have swapped our faith in God with secularism. We have swapped the Bible with man's thoughts. And it's been a disaster that has resulted in the moral collapse of our nation. There has been a stunning rise of what socialists call nuns or nuns among our young people. What that means is more and more of our young people are now identifying in this nation as non when it comes to their religious affiliation. It's, it, the sociologists have come up with that term nuns or uh, this meaning that there's, there's no religious affiliation, there's no uh, a faith, there's no uh, moral uh, a guide. There's been a collapse of our faith that has caused a moral vacuum that has been filled with drugs, alcohol, and casual sex. The need for God's people to unite and to pray has been is so great in this hour. The prayer focus is for you and I. We are challenged and we are encouraged. We are encouraged other people to pray for our nation. Jeremiah chapter 29. We see that the people of God were carried captive to a foreign land. They were carried captive to Babylon. They were carried captive and they were they were, many of them even died in the journey. Many of them, when, when Babylon came and overthrew Judah, the nation, they carried people captive, but they also slaughtered people. But God said in Jeremiah chapter 29, when you go to the land of Babylon, I want you to pray for the peace of the city. Now, it's easy to pray when we, we like someone, it's easy to pray when, when it's conducive in some ways. But, but God was saying to his people, I want you to pray for the peace of the city. I want you to pray for Babylon. Now that's hard to do. And, and, and I, could, I could relate it to other areas of our life. Um, when we don't particularly like a political party or we don't particularly like a politician or we don't particularly like even uh, some things that are going on in our nation and, and, and we, we find it hard. But God told his people, listen, you're my people. I want you to pray for the peace of Babylon. I want you to pray for the peace of, of, the, of the nation, of the, of the community, of the people that I sent you among. Our international community, which we are so blessed in our church to have 25, 30 nations represented. Our international community has come to the U.S. to find a better life, more opportunities, jobs, better jobs. Someone ought to be saying amen and say, God bless America. Educational opportunities, houses, cars, material blessings. And then there are those of us who have been born in this country, but we have taken for granted our blessings, our freedoms, and our opportunities. 
We have seen an ungodly cultural tsunami that has turned this nation upside down. There has been an upheaval that has affected every level of society. Government, education, media, financial systems, even our churches and ministries have been affected by this ungodly cultural tsunami. We have strayed far from our secure foundations of truth and morality, of honor and of respect. You don't have to look far to see that the word of God is accurate in its portrayal of a society that turns away from God. In Romans chapter 1, Paul pens under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he shares with us what the characteristics will be or what it will look like in a culture that demands its own way. In a culture that pushes God out. In a culture that rejects moral truth. And calls truth. Relative. Here's what Paul has to say of a, of a people, of a culture that says, God, we don't want you. God, we're bent on doing our own thing. We want to go our own way. And you know what God does? The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, therefore God gave them up. What does that mean? Does that mean God gives up on us? No, that doesn't mean that. It means when a people want to do their own thing and, and they persist in it, God has no choice but to move out of the way and allow the consequences of the sin to take place and allow the downward spiral to pick up momentum and allow the cause and the effect to be so powerful and so evident that people must realize they must turn to God or else they are sinking in quicksand spiritually. How many of you still with me? Yeah. Romans chapter 1 verse 24. God gave them up to uncleanness. In the lusts of their hearts. To dishonor their bodies among themselves. For those they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Who is blessed forevermore. Amen. Yeah. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their woman exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also men leaving the natural use of, of the woman have burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their, their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Listen to, listen to God's assessment, the, an extra, a spiritual x-ray of the soul of America. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent Proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do they do the same, but approve of those who practice them. What an accurate assessment. My Lord, what, what a, a description of, of where we are as a culture and as a people. It's sad to say that these characteristics, this moral decline has, has infected the church, has affected the church in many ways. To where we are guilty of the very same things that the word of God condemns and that we have preached against. We have seen it come into the church and we're guilty of the same things. God have mercy. The question is what will arrest the moral decline? What will stem the tide of evil? What will halt the decline of our culture? Nothing but a revival amongst God's people. 
Not until the people of God come alive in their faith, alive in their relationship with Jesus. And not until the people of God fall in love with Jesus all over again. Only when we give more than a polite nod of agreement and a quiet amen. But with a heartfelt, sincere, and holy conviction, we give heed to 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, and, and, and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Although we are not the Jewish nation praying for the country and people of Israel, as is the context of that scripture, if you would turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Nonetheless, we are God's people. We are God's people who in principle can come into agreement with God as he has promised in his word. We can pray for our country. You and I are here in the good old U.S. of A. Not by accident, but by divine design. God has placed us here for a holy purpose. Not just to seek after the American dream, but to seek after the will of God. And to do what God has commanded us in his word. That we would preach his gospel. That we would advance his kingdom. That we would do his will in our generation. God's called us to use our resources, our opportunities, our advantages that we have in this nation to promote the kingdom of our God and of his Lord. Amen. Can we align ourselves with God's purposes? And view the world through a biblical lens. How do we view our world through a biblical lens? By knowing and hearing and giving heed to the word of God. How do we view our world through a biblical view? By knowing God's word. Most Christians today have a worldview that is not in line with the scriptures, but is in line with the culture, or is in line with a political persuasion, or is in line with Hollywood, or is in line with media. God have mercy. The Bible gives us the heart and the mind of God. If we don't know the word, we don't know how it applies to our life. We don't know the promises God has made to us. We don't know what we can claim in our lives for our family, for our church, for our nation. If we don't know the word. So many people are ignorant of the word of God. It's just amazing. I talk to pastors all the time. We have seen a decline of Bible knowledge among Christians. But here at Victory, we're not going to be according to the statistics. Amen? We're going to reverse the statistics. We're going to go above and beyond the statistics. But it's important. See, when you don't know something, you don't enjoy the benefit of it. You don't know what God has promised. You don't know that if he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll make it to pass. You don't know what your faith can rely upon and what you can receive from God if you don't know the word of God. Amen. Two, and a, two and a half years ago, uh, we, we leased uh, Hyundai um, Santa Fe, an SUV. And <clears throat> And what we didn't know is that with this vehicle, uh, there, was, there was an added benefit uh, that just came along with the lease. It was called the Blue Link. And, and this app and this uh, um, uh, service that came along uh, had, had a lot of benefits. But you know what? We never read the, the manual. And for two years, we didn't realize... My wife didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, she was very happy to find out, but it was two years into it. That with Blue Link, there was an automatic starter. For two years, we had to endure the cold and the fridge. Well, well, what suffering we experience in this country. But for two years, we didn't know that our vehicle had... We were, gonna, we were even thinking of paying three, dollars $400 to have an automatic starter installed. But we didn't know that with our lease came this Benefit, this advantage, this nice extra that we have, all you have to do is download the app. You can set the temperature. You can set when you want it to go on. You get all these nice features. We didn't know for two years our lease is almost up. And we missed out on all the benefits. 
But isn't it true with God's word? If you don't know the scriptures, if you don't know what God has promised, you can't partake of it, you can't enjoy it, you can't be blessed by it. Come on, we need to know to enjoy what God has blessed us with, to, to have the authority to pray, to, to walk in, in faith. You know, one of the places that I go to study during the week, I kind of go through different seasons. I'll go to this place, then I'll go to that place, and I just kind of just kind of have a, a certain feel of where I'd like to study and just spend two or three hours working on my sermon once a week at a particular place. And this one place that I, I've been going to, on the way to the bathroom, I noticed there's a woman sitting there, and, and she's reading tarot cards. She's, she's a fortune teller. I said, are you kidding me? She's telling someone's future. And, and I overheard her. She was giving her counsel, her wisdom, her advice as, as related to what she was reading in the cards. And I said, God, have mercy. You know, when people are so deceived that they, they, don't, they, they need to look to some tarot cards or, or some, some uh, 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 scam artist that, that, that is reading their cards and giving them wisdom. We got wisdom from the word of God. I remember I heard of a ministry. I think it was out in California. California do a lot of strange things out there, but, but some things we can learn from them. Uh, this one particular, hope no one's from California here. But, but one church in California, what they did in one of their outreaches, they set up a table where they said, we read your fortunes. What they did was they got the Bible out. And we can tell you what your future is going to be like. If you obey God, you're going to be blessed. If you disobey God, you're going to be cursed. If you accept Jesus, you're going to go to heaven. If you reject him, you're going to go to hell. How many of you know you can tell somebody's future? But you need to know the word of God. You need to know God's word. Amen. We as Bible believing Christians and, and as people of faith. You know, we need to pray and, and, and pray for our nation and, and come into focus and come into alignment and join the thousands of churches, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that will be praying for America. Uh, how, how, how strategic is this? How, how critical is this? How timely that, that this would come out? Just We got this in the mail weeks ago and then we hear another tragedy in our nation. Another tragedy in our nation. God have mercy. But we need to pray, amen? We need to pray as God's people. Not just any kind of prayer. We need to pray. You know why? Because you can pray and not be heard. You can pray and God will turn a deaf ear. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me in, in Psalm 66, verse 18, the, the psalmist said, if I, if I keep or regard and hit iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We need to confess our sins. Come on, we need, to, we need to, 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 to understand that in the word of God, there are certain characteristics of, of prayer that God will respond. Now, come on, some of you are worrying. You say, if that's his introduction, this is going to be a long sermon. He didn't even get into his main text. No, my introduction is longer than my sermon. I think anyway. If it goes long, I'm going to blame it on the Holy Spirit because he's just giving me stuff. Come on, don't look at me like that. Amen. How many of you like when the, when the, when the football game goes into overtime? When the baseball game goes into extra innings? When the movies are four hours? Get to church, we want to run out. Thank you for that week. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 7. I'm going, to, I'm going to rush right through this. You know this. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. What a promise. What a promise. Again, that was given uh, to Solomon and, and, and God spoke that to him for the nation of Israel. And, and again, this is, this is in the context for Israel. But, but again, in principle, we can apply it. The principles of God are true. Why? Can, can we not humble ourselves? Amen? I'm talking about humility. I'm talking about coming before God and acknowledging that we need His grace, that we need His mercy. You know, in the Bible, there's many times that people knelt in prayer. I think that's still a good practice. 
There's times that people prostrated themselves. They laid down before God. I believe that's still a good practice. There are times why the posture isn't always doesn't always mean something, but it does. It does put us in a place where we do understand that we are nothing. He is everything. We humble ourselves. Humility is such a, a, a missing thing in the, our churches. There's such pride. We're so defensive. You can't tell people anything anymore. People get defensive. You can't confront anybody anymore because there's a lack of humility. Do you know in the Bible when, when uh, Daniel, when Nehemiah, when Jeremiah, when they prayed for their nation. Now I'm talking about the people of God. I'm talking about you this morning. I'm talking about me. When we pray for America, you know what? We have to acknowledge that we're part of the problem. Daniel, Jeremiah, ne Nehemiah, they confessed their sins. They said, Lord, we're part of the problem. The reason why this nation is like it is is because Christians have not taken their faith seriously. And we have sinned right along with the rest of the world. And we've been, we've been complicit with their, their sin and their evil. If Nehemiah and Daniel, godly men, could say, Lord, forgive me. I confess my sin. I confess the sin of my nation. God help us. We need that, that humility. See, when you're humble, you take responsibility. When you're proud, you blame other people. We're living in a nation where everybody's playing the blame game. I know it's going to get quiet. I know some of you are going to look at me with an attitude, but that's okay. I remember what God said to Ezekiel. He said, don't look at their faces. I'm going to look at good faith. Come on, come on. I want to look at people's responses. Amen. Thank you. We're living in a nation. We're all playing the game, blame game. We blame the Democrats. Oh, it's going to get quiet. I know, I know, I know. You're going to get off. Oh, is he preaching on politics? No, I'm preaching the word of God. We blame the Republicans. There's a mass shooting. I, I had to turn the news off. I had to turn Fox off. And I had to turn CNN off. I got all of you right now. I had to turn it off because I was sick of hearing they were blaming this one and they were blaming that one. We play the blame game. And you know the blame game started all the way back in Genesis. Right at the beginning of creation. What happened? Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. They sinned. They did the wrong thing. And you know what happened? God came to them. And Adam, you know what I always used to believe? Adam blamed Eve. But you know what? I, as I read that over and over again, you know what? He did not only blame Eve, he blamed God. He said, the woman you gave me. Oh my Lord, think about that. Adam was not only, God, the father was a perfect father. God was a perfect father. And he blamed God, he says, you gave me this woman. It's your fault. You gave me. Adam blamed God. He blamed Eve. And you know what Eve did? Blamed the serpent. Nobody's taking responsibility. God help us. God help us. Is there enough humility to go around and say, Lord, it's me. It's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We blame people. We, we, we wonder why our culture is crazy. Look at the media. Look at what we promoted in Hollywood. We wonder why we, we, there's such a sensual spirit and, and there's all kind of pornography and there's all kind of lust and there's all kind of perversion and there's all kind of sin. We have promoted sex. We have applauded it. And then, and then we talk about guns. We have promoted it in Hollywood. A movie's not a good movie unless 20, 30 people die brutally. Even our video games. I'm not going to ask you how many people you kill in your video games. You brutalize. Oh, it's going to get quiet. Come on now. Come on now. We, we make light of it. It don't matter anymore. We're killing people. We're, we're mowing them down in games. We're watching TV and movies, and the more violence, the more people are killed, the more we enjoy it, and the more people flock to it. The nation's gone crazy. Amen. We've gone crazy, and we wonder why there's bloodshed. We wonder why kids are taking machine guns. They think they're playing a game. 
I know there's other factors, there's mental illness, I know there are those things, but listen, 50 years ago, they were using spitballs. What's happened? The moral decline of a nation. The moral bankruptcy of a nation. A nation that kicked God out, prayer out, the Ten Commandments out, and we wonder why we're in the position we're in, the condition we're in. Humility. Humble themselves. Stop blaming other people. There's enough blame to go around. Yes, we do need some, some, some adjustments in our gun laws. There's greed on the part of the, those who produce the guns. They want to produce guns. Why? Because they make money. But there's also a lot to blame the moral decay of a nation. Where the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, God gave them up. What does that mean? God says, you don't want me. You don't want my laws. Okay, I'm going to get out of the way. And let's see what happens. So we wonder what's happening in our nation. God's saying, you want to you sow the wind? You're going to reap the world wind. You want to sow to your flesh? You're going to reap corruption. Come on, is that not true? Say amen. It's like the devil. Humble yourselves. The church has to lead the way. We have to stop and stop blaming other people. Take responsibility and say, what is my, you know, but we all like to blame. Everybody's blaming somebody. Listen, if I blame, if I want to blame people the way I am today, well, I got to blame it on my father. He's going to blame it on his father. His father's going to blame it on his father. You know what it's going back to? Adam and Eve. And you know what? We're going to blame God. Just like him. I remember, I remember a preacher telling the story of two men who grew up in the same home, same parents, same circumstances, same condition, and, and the father that they grew up under was, a, was an alcoholic. He was, he was a, an alcoholic who blew his family's money and messed up his family, and he had two sons. One said, one became an alcoholic, and he said, you know what, I'm an alcoholic because my father is. The other son Never, never, never touched alcohol, never went that way. And you know what he said? I'm not an alcoholic because my father was. He made a choice. He made a decision. I've got to make a decision. I can blame things on other people. I can blame my problems on this one, that church person, this one who did this to me, this one who said that to me. And some people are not coming to church today because they got offended. Somebody told them not to sit over there, but to sit over there. Humility. If my people who call by my name will humble, I gotta hurry up. <laughs> Seek his face. Seek his face. The Bible says, humble themselves. Seek his face. You know what's interesting about that? You've got to understand something. When you look at somebody's face, what does that mean? That means there's a there's a connection, right? Relational and intimacy, right? We seek God's hand. What that speaks of is we want his blessing. What can God do for me? How can God meet my needs? How can God supply what I want? How can God bless me? God's not a divine Santa Claus. He's our heavenly father. He's our God. Seek his face. That means intimacy. That means loving him and serving him and knowing him. One time I went to a, a pastor's conference in Florida. And, and my flight, uh, connecting flight, uh, I missed it or it was canceled. So they, 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 the airline gave me a voucher for a cab that was like an hour and a half ride to my destination. I was supposed to be right, right at the venue. Uh, I get there late. I get this long cab ride and, and, and I got to rush to get into the venue. I don't want to miss anything. And, and you know what I realized after the fact? When I was getting out of the vehicle in a hurry, I noticed that the cab driver, he wasn't looking at my face. He was looking at my hand. Oh, you're not with me. I gotta... In other words, he was looking that I have something. So he's like looking at I didn't realize it until afterwards. He, wasn't, he didn't care about my faith. He wasn't looking to be friends with me. He was looking for what I can give him. He was looking at my hand. Sometimes as the people of God, we only look to God's hand. We don't look at his face. But God's saying, I want to be relational with you. I, I want to have a, a relationship. I love you. I want you to love me. Not for what you, I give you, but for who I am. Turn 
from their wicked ways. This is repentance. We've already touched on that, but we come into agreement with God. We don't judge our life based upon Hollywood, based upon social media. We don't judge our life upon even, even church, but we base our life upon the word of God. And what is God? And I'm going to move on. I'm going to finish. What, what will God do? He said, I'll hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. I'm telling you, God is looking for a people. I have studied revivals. I have studied church histories, uh, the church history over the last 2,000 years. And I've noticed one thing. Revivals happen when it's the darkest in culture. When things are the most difficult. Why? Because people get desperate and they know they need God and they can't rely on worldly comforts or worldly uh, uh, strength. They're going to rely upon God. What will God do? He said, I will hear from heaven. God will hear from heaven. What will he do? He'll forgive our sin. What a good God we serve. I thank God that God forgives my sin. God forgives your sin. He's a God of forgiveness. Someone say amen. amen. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin. And I will heal your land. Amen. God wants to heal our land. We need to pray. God wants to minister healing to our lives, to our families, to our church. But we have to, we have to pray. We have to humble ourselves. You know, I'm asking you to join with me as your pastor. That we pray for an awakening in America. And we pray for revival in our churches. Two different things. An awakening is when, when the people who do not know God, they come to conviction of sin. They come to a, a spiritual understanding of their need for God. That's an awakening. We need to pray for an awakening. People are callous today. People are indifferent today. People are angry today. But the Holy Spirit can still break through and create a hunger and a thirst and a desire and awaken them to their need of God. And then we need to pray for revival. Revival is for the church. It's for the people of God to come alive again, to be revived. We need to come alive. You know, we need to pray for our nation. God has us here. And just like God told the people in, in Babylon, pray for the peace of the city. Pray for Babylon. We need to pray for America. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, I exhort you that prayers and supplications be made for all people, for those that are in authority, for, for governors, for, for kings, that we may lead a peaceable life. For God desires that all men would come be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We need to pray. A, a, a friend of my wife's that she knew growing up in church, back in their home church in Bangalore, Maine, they just reconnected and they were emailing and one of the email, emails was, listen to this, this person, I don't know what church they work at, but listen to what they said. This is just in the correspondence with my wife. Um, he's saying, how do I know it? Do I read her email? No, it came through the church account. <laughs> Here's what she said, I'm getting ready for a South Korean prayer missions team to come Monday for nine days. They are, there are over 200 South Koreans coming from South Korea to the U.S. to 20 places in the U.S. for the sole purpose of praying with other churches for revival in the United States. Missionaries, they're coming from other nations to America, from South Korea, to pray for nine days to go to 12 cities and to pray strategically for revival in America. God have mercy. We need to rise up. We are the people of God in this nation, in this hour, for such a time as this, and pray for America. Would you stand together with me this morning? I'm going to ask the worship team to come back this morning as we close in these next few moments with a challenge to pray the next 30 days, to take a few minutes every day. Simply, there's going to be a prayer focus, and it's just simple. Each day, let, let God's people pray. If my people, if God says then, if, it's conditional. It's a conditional promise. If God's people do their part, God will do his part. I don't know how much more time we have in this nation or in this world 
Jesus could come back any time. But I do believe that whatever time God has allotted us, we're here in this moment of time, strategically, God has allowed us to be here. For such a time as this, strategically to be praying, to be the people of God, to be the church, to stand in the gap. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel, the Lord said, I saw it. I saw it for a man to stand in the gap that I might not destroy the land. And you know what God said? I found no one. May God find many, many people here in victory and around the United States. Not only in our Assembly of God churches, but, but every Bible-believing church, every true church of God. Praying for this nation, praying for an awakening, and praying for revival. I'm going to ask you this morning, just do, do, do one thing. We're going, to, we're going to leave in five minutes, I promise you. If I don't finish, you can leave in five minutes. But I, I want to seal, I want to seal this, this call to action by you stepping out of your seat and standing at the altar and presenting yourself and saying, Lord, I want to be that person that prays. I want to be that person that stands in the gap. Come on, that's a holy that's a high responsibility as the people of God. Come on, all of us committed. Come on, you say, well, I've got my own problems. I've got my own needs. I've got my own things I'm dealing with. Yes, I understand that. So do I. But you know what? We pray. We seek first the kingdom of God. And what did God say? I'll take care of the rest. I've got to keep committing things to him, but it's not going to stop me from doing what God's called me to do, what God's called you to do. Let's seek him first and foremost. Let's seek his kingdom. Let's seek his righteousness. We trust him with all things this morning. If you could just lead us in one chorus, and then I'm going to close us in prayer. But come on, just commit yourself this morning. Not just seeking God's hand. Many times we come to the altar seeking what God can do for us. Now we're coming to the altar to seek his face. We want to know him. We want to be intimate. We want to be in relationship with God the Father. You are always fighting for heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of the praise, in your name
Thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for a, a call to action, a call to prayer. God, I ask you to go beyond my words, go beyond my abilities, go beyond anything I said. And that you would, by the power of your spirit, bring conviction, bring a challenge to every heart, God, to do, to pray more than we've ever prayed before, especially for this nation in this hour. God, our hearts are broken when we see our culture in decline and all of the, the fruit of that, the bad fruit, all of the evil, all of the sin, all of the bigotry, the hatred, the racism, all of the anger. God, it's just the fruit, God. The root of the problem is a sinful nature that will not surrender to you. God, but we ask you first and foremost that you would forgive us, God, for, for our part. God, forgive your people, God. God, forgive us. Bring conviction in our lives, God. Over any sin, small and great, God, that we won't point the finger at another person, but we would examine our own heart. And so, God, that we would ask you to forgive us and that we would pray for your, your people, this nation, God. Father God, I pray you would just bless the word to our hearts and bring about your intended purpose. May your will be done in this hour. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, yeah. Amen. And amen. Turn to a few people. Let them know you're going to come into agreement to pray for this nation. God bless you. Greet someone. Let them know that you're glad you've seen them today, that you've been a part of this worship service. Amen.